What does the Bible say about images? Are they good? Are they bad? The debate has always been great throughout history. But remember, as God's children, more than history, what we must subject ourselves to is the biblical principle. What does God's word say in regards to images? Because we cannot do it alone, nor should we. Welcome to our devotional, Mana, where we listen to and obey God's word. Glory to God for this topic. Many of you wrote to me yesterday. Yesterday we began talking about what an idol is. We reviewed Exodus chapter 20, where we said that God strictly in his word says, You will not have foreign gods before me. But look at the following expression. It says, You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. And I believe in this, we as Christians should understand something. And this is the importance of obeying and what is behind the commandment and obedience. I meet many people throughout my life as a pastor that tell me in regards to images, because this is a common topic amongst people. They say, Pastor, look, the images I have, I do not worship them. The images I have are like pictures that I look at every once in a while and remember, but I do not worship them. Well, those who have this thought, I want to answer them from the Bible. The Bible tells us, do not create for yourself images. It is not saying create an image, but do not worship it. No, that's not what it's saying. What it's saying emphatically, it is that it is, it is completely prohibited to create for yourself an image of God. Now, this has a reason for being and why, because when we talk about idolatry, we're talking about the honor owed to the one and only true God is given to something created, something invented by his creation. And this can vary in many ways. Yesterday, we read a very powerful passage that has always been very impactful to me in Psalm 106, where it says, they exchanged God's glory, the glory of the living God, of the true God, for the image of an ox that eats grass. And talking about the Bible being emphatic, I want to refer to a passage in Exodus chapter 32. Do you recall the Bible tells us that when the children of Israel were in the wilderness and Moses had gone, it says that they created a calf. And when they created this calf, they said in Exodus 32, four and five. They said, this is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. And it says that they made a proclamation and said, tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. So what was we say about this passage? Look, I'm convinced that the children of Israel were not looking to replace God. It did not cross their minds. When they persuaded Aaron to create this golden calf, they truly were not creating an idol to go against or to be a rival of God. But instead, what they were looking for was for the idol to be a helper, a representative of God, representing their service to God. But family, this is where we and the people of Israel are mistaken. This was a grave sin. And why? Because the honor owed to God became a visible representation of him. It was an offense against the majesty of our God. The commandment was broken when Israel did this. And precisely the great lesson here in this point that we are discussing this morning must lead us precisely to the root of this matter. Why does God prohibit an image be created of him? Look, this experience of the golden calf was profoundly embedded in the memory of God's people. And why? Because they knew they had offended God. And when Moses comes down and the discipline was that he took that golden calf, threw it into the fire, then placed the pieces in water and made them drink it themselves. So what should be clear to us when God says in his word, do not create for yourself images? Well, that God cannot be, cannot be encompassed in an image. God cannot be limited to an idea nor to an institution. I believe throughout history, what we've tried to do is to almost capture God to a God that we can hold on to, that we can take. 
there's a story that perhaps you have read before. The story about Rebecca, daughter of Laban, wife of Jacob. And the Bible tells us that when Jacob said to Rebecca that they needed to go back because they were to return to their land in order for God's purpose to be fulfilled. Do you know what Rebecca did? She took her father's idols and stole them. And when I read this text, there is something here that I say, can we really understand this text or not? How is it that she steals the idols of her father? How is it possible that I can have a God that my children can steal or that anybody can just take and steal? This cannot be. When God says in his word that we should not create ourselves images, it is because God is the absolute God of all things. I don't know if you've ever read the text when one day there in the book of Samuel, David says that he is going to build a temple for the Lord because he says, how is it that I live in a nice house filled with all types of comforts and God does not have a place And the Bible says that David said, I'm going to build a home for God a temple for God to live in. And when he goes to God to tell him that he's going to build a temple for him, do you know what God answered? God said, are you going to build me a temple? Do you not see that not even the heavens of the heavens can contain me, yet you say I'm going to build a home for the Lord? Here lies the problem of representation. The problem with representations is that the majority of people for many people, it is as if they can place God in a jar. God can be carried on a necklace, or that God can be held in a picture frame, or be placed in a church and remain there. This is the problem with representations, that we want a God that we can bring or we can take, that we can show. But the problem with this is that this very same God remains in our mind and becomes the God of our faith, a small God an encompassed God, a God with so many limitations. I remember as a child, in the light of the religion I was raised in, I would see Christ fallen or a Christ crucified, a Christ whom many people went and offered a bunch of sacrifices. Sometimes I would see the figure of Christ on a picture frame and it was sort of scary. Or sometimes I, felt, I even felt shame to see how he suffered. Sometimes it's difficult to describe, but all this, these things have an impact over us. In neurolinguistics, the figures that we create of things is very important. And this is why I'm speaking to you about this this morning. Look, in Christian life, if there is something important in Christian life, is that we stop being religious and instead truly embark in the path of the knowledge of God and of His Word. I'm going to give you a personal example, and it's very personal, but I'm going to tell you how the Bible helped me remove the image I had of that picture, that framed picture of Christ, that sad, wounded, suffering God. Because when I began to read the Psalms, and the psalmist said, for example, when I see the heavens work of your fingers, the heavens and the stars that you created, I say, who is man that you have memory of him and the son of man that you visit him? When I read scripture, it says that God created the stars and he calls each one of them by their name, that the stars are his armies. The Bible says that he travels on the wings of the winds, that he made the winds, his messengers, the clouds, his carriages, and the flames of fire, his ministers that he looks at the earth and it trembles, that he touches the mountains and they smoke, that he picks up all the dirt from the earth with three fingers and the seas he encompasses in his hands. And so when I begin to read the Psalms, I say, wow, God does not fit in my mind. I cannot even begin to imagine him. His greatness is such, his love, his plentitude, his perfection, his glory. And this is when I pray that I understand that this God, this God of the Bible, the only one and true God, a God that knows it all, that can do it all, that sees it all, for whom there is nothing impossible. But our problem, my dear family, pay close attention. Our problem, our religion has created us, has created for us a false God, a God that is not real, a poor God, 
a limited God or a God does, that does not understand all things. Because as I mentioned, it is a God that we can carry with us, that we can bring or take or keep. A God that can be stolen. Imagine that. So many false conceptions. And I insist, this is the tendency of man to have something that can be encompassed, held, manipulated, dominated. And this is what has happened throughout the years. That we want to have a God that can be presented. A God that we can manipulate. And this biblical prohibition of images requires that each day we approach scripture so that we may have the critical ability to understand that the image we create of God, whether it is physical, intellectual, or whatever it may be, will always be limited. When the Bible talks about who God is, it leads us, leads us to understand one thing, that we will never fully understand who God is. Imagine how beautiful. And so when we look at what the Bible says, why do we want to use images? Well, because what we are attempting to do is to try to feel, to touch God's divinity. We want to bring God down to our lower level because we want our spiritual life to be something that is accessible by our senses, especially to our sense of sight. And this does not make sense because then your faith will be broken. Why don't you listen to God's voice this morning? Why don't you accept the following challenge with me? Approach scripture each day and come to know the one and only true God. Join us each day as we read scripture. Begin Bible study. You should stop looking at the Bible as a sort of amulet or something that is there on the nightstand in your home that looks nice. No, dust off that Bible. Open it. Study with us. But in the measure that you study, allow me to tell you that biblical study is not like the knowledge we acquire from books or other things. No, the knowledge of God becomes something that no one can take from me. Because to know God, to know his beauty, his power, his presence, his glory, his holiness, all of God's attributes lead us to say this is a true blessing for our faith. And so look, the explanation I'm giving you is not about attacking anyone. I'm simply teaching you the Bible, teaching you what God's word says. And so if you're listening to this devotional today, I'm not attacking anyone or going against anyone. I am simply saying what God's word tells us. And I believe that we must be obedient to what is written and not to what other men say, or even to what tradition tells us. Because our calling is to obey God's word. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the beginning of this new day. And forgive us. Forgive us if sometimes because of our ignorance or because of tradition, we have invalidated your name or invalidated your word or invalidated your greatness affecting our faith. Because when we try to sort of capture you in a medal, in a stamp, in a picture frame or whatever it may be, truly we are going against a commandment with which you were very emphatic that we should not create any image of you because the best image of God is everything that has been created. If you want to see God, look at creation. If you want to see God's love, God's presence, just look at a baby when it is born. Just look at the trees, the rivers, the birds. That is the beauty that represents God, a God that knows it all, that can do it all, that sees it all. A God that has all the power and the authority to move powerfully in our lives. Thank you, Lord, for this time. Bless each listener of Manar and may your blessing and your presence be in the middle of your lives and in your hearts. We commend ourselves to you and we ask for your blessing. And I await for you tomorrow. Blessings to all.